Welcome to the presentation using an algorithm to implement peripheral vestibular hypofunction updated CPG. My name is Amy York and I'm one of the co-chairs of the vestibular hypofunction updated clinical practice guideline KT task force. So welcome to our presentation today. The objective of this session is that you'd be able to utilize the assessment and intervention algorithms associated with the updated clinical practice guideline in a person with peripheral vestibular hypofunction. You can find this information at neuropt.org. And then if you look, you'll come up under some clinical practice guideline summary or just scan the QR code. So clinical practice guidelines really provide a bridge between research and the healthcare team. And so you can see that the original proposal for the original CPG happened in 2012. And so if we fast forward now 10 years, there's not only been the original that was published in 2016, but also the revised version. Please use the QR code to access this article. And so it's really important that you understand what this clinical prac line includes. And so it includes patients that have peripheral vestibular hypofunction, no matter the etiology. So whether it's vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis, and it is confirmed with vestibular function laboratory testing or a video head impulse testing. This clinical practice guideline does not include patients that have dizziness due to central involvement, such as a brain injury, concussion, MS or Parkinson's disease, or BPPV. And so if we look at the evidence and we look at summarizing the evidence, you can see that there is levels of strong evidence, moderate, as well as weak. So again, this clinical practice guidelines recommendation came from 202 articles. And so before we kind of dive into the algorithm, I want you to make sure that you understand where these recommendations on the algorithm come from. So there is really strong evidence for the effectiveness of vestibular rehabilitation in patients across time, whether it be acute, subacute, or chronic whether they have one side or both sides that have hypofunction, with supervision in order to improve their quality of life. There is moderate evidence that exercise that spe address specific goals related to patient impairments, activity limitations, participation restrictions, when to stop vestibular rehab, and then things that might modify your outcome, and weak expert um, evidence for dosing. So as we think about these algorithms, one of the first algorithms we're going to talk about is this idea of outmeasure selection. And so there are numerous outcome measures that have been utilized in order to help monitor the outcomes of patients who have vestibular dysfunction. And there is no consensus that exists on a core set of outcome measures to use in patients with vestibular hypofunction. And the updated clinical practice guideline does not make recommendations for specific outcome measures, but it does discuss them. As a physical therapist, you should consider using the vestibular edge task force recommendation along with the 2018 neurological outcome measures clinical practice guidelines. And so a patient with peripheral vestibular hypofunction, right? We're gonna to look to select the correct outcome measure will commonly report symptoms that fall into three large categories, dizziness and vertigo, vertigo visual blurring with head movement and imbalance or falls. So let's take a look at each of these. So if the patient reports dizziness and or vertigo, you could consider using the available measures. The dizziness handicap inventory highlighted in orange is recommended by the Vestibular Edge Task Force. Now, if the patient reports more visual blurring with head movement, this indicates an issues perhaps with the vestibular ocular reflex, you could consider assessing dynamic visual acuity or the gaze stabilization test. And our last court category, is if the patient reports problems with imbalance and or falls, you could have several different measures to pick from. Those in orange, as well as with two asterisks, such as the functional gait assessment and the ABC scale, are from the Neural Outcome Measure Clinical Practice Guideline. So again, a patient with peripheral vestibular hypofunctions, common reports will fall into these three categories. This algorithm helps you select what would be the right outcome measure measures to utilize for that patient. So now let's move toward intervention. So when we think about what our patient reports with, a physical therapist then could use this decision-making algorithm for ensuring implementation of the evidence that aligns with the clinical practice guideline. Vestibular physical therapy commonly falls into these four categories. Again, dizziness and vertigo, the patient reports that, visual blurring with head movement, imbalance under falls, as well as poor endurance. If the patient reports more dizziness and vertigo, and perhaps use the dizziness handicap inventory to assess that, 
You would then look to do habituation to intervene. Habituation is the reduction in the behavioral response after repeated exposure to a provocative stimulus with the goal of reducing symptoms related to the vestibular system. Habituation exercises are chosen specifically based on specific movements or situations, maybe really busy visual environments that provoke symptoms. If your patient has more visual blurring and perhaps you assess that with the dynamic visual acuity test, you would do more gaze stability and depending on whether it's unilateral or bilateral, acute, subacute, or chronic, you would change the dosage. Gaze stabilization exercises based on the principles of adaptation involve head movement while maintaining focus on a target, which may be stationary or moving. No matter whether it's unilateral, acute, subacute, chronic, you would want your patient to engage in gaze stability at least three times a day. Patients with acute to subacute lesions, which is this idea of two weeks to three months, should do them for at least 12 minutes a day, and those with more chronic, greater than three months, at least 20 minutes a day. And those with bilateral lesions, vestibular hypofunction, should do 20 to 40 minutes per day. If a person has imbalance and or falls, you would want to work on balancing gait. And again, you may have assessed this maybe with a functional gait assessment. Balancing gait activities can include a variety of activities that modify the base of support, as well as activities that promote the improvement of dynamic control. The updated clinical practice guidelines specifically provided recommendation for dosage. This information can be helpful to you as you develop your plan of care. And patients with poor endurance may benefit from a walking program. You may have examined this through your six minute walk test. General conditioning, such as a customized graduated walking program for endurance, is frequently an element in vestibular physical therapy because individuals with peripheral vestibular dysfunction often limit their amount of physical activity to avoid symptom provocation. By itself, however, general conditioning exercise not involving a balance component, such as being on a stationary bike or isometric strengthening, has not been found to be beneficial in individuals with vestibular hypofunction. And I want to point out here, there is a strong recommendation that voluntary psychotic or smooth pursuit eye exercises should not be offered in isolation as gaze stabilization exercises. And again, there is a strong recommendation for use of targeted exercise techniques for acute and chronic unilateral peripheral vestibular hypofunction. So again, based on the patient report, right, falling into three separate categories, this then leads us to our appropriate intervention. I want to acknowledge all the members of the KT task force who have been working diligently to create products for you to make this clinical practice guideline easier for you to implement into your practice. Please make sure you check out our additional resources located at the link below, as well as looking for therapist information, patient information, and a podcast. This concludes our recording.